Yeah, I'll talk about uh, something called Tarski circle squaring problem. Uh, this is based on joint work with Andras Mate and Oleg Prokurko, um, who are both at the University of Warwick, which is uh, where I was a postdoc before I came here. Let me start with just a basic definition, which is pretty important for the rest of the talk. So everything we're going to deal with here is in Euclidean space. So k is some positive integer. We're dealing in r to the k. So let a and b be two subsets of r to the k. So an equidecomposition of a and b is a pair of finite sequences of sets, a1 up to an, b1 up to bn, which has, have the following three properties. So the first property is kind of simple. So the sets a1 up to an partition a. Similarly, b1 up to bn partition b. And then the third thing that makes everything tricky is that AI has to be congruent to BI for all I. So what do I mean by congruent? So that basically, two sets are congruent. If I can take the first set, translate it, maybe rotate it, maybe reflect it if you really want to, to get the second set. So kind of geometrically, they have the same shape. So basically, yeah, you can apply an isometry to go from one to the other. But if you don't like the word isometry, yeah, just translate, r rotate, and, and things like that. Visually, you think of these things as kind of cutting up the, the set into kind of connected bits. but but there's no assumption here that these sets are connected themselves, right? So A1 could be a smattering of points which have no connection to each other or, or something like that. Okay, so the sets A1 up to AN are called the uh, pieces of the equity composition. Even though, yeah, like I said, this, the word piece kind of sometimes gets misleading because a piece might not be a kind of contiguous connected set. A piece could be have some points over here, some points over here, and whatever. And if an equity composition exists, we say that the sets A and B are equity composable. Okay, so, I mean, here's a kind of basic example. So I've got this sort of duck-shaped, uh, or maybe goose, Canada goose-shaped, <laughs> you know, figure here. And then I've got this kind of octagon. So the way I'm kind of drawing this is, you know, the sets of points of the same color are part of the same piece, right? So, so this red piece is four consecutive blocks here which you can see is congruent to this red set here, right? Just rotate it, slide it over. This purple set is a, is a kind of disconnected set of points, but if you kind of move them all by the same translation and then 90 degree rotation, you see it's the same as this set, right? But you're not allowed to, you're not allowed to move this stuff independently of that stuff. So in some sense, this is an equidecomposition from this goose to the, this like a regular octagon thing. Although I am cheating a little bit because I'm not really telling you what to do on the boundaries of these pieces. Um, but if we, yeah, if we sort of ignore boundaries, this is an equity composition. So this is a nice example, which is fairly intuitive. Let me tell you something that's very counterintuitive. Yeah, so the bonak tarski paradox says that if you take a closed ball of volume one, or open ball, it doesn't really matter, you can equity compose that into two balls of volume one, so A is is this set, B is this set. Basically, you can break up your set of your ball of volume one into finitely many pieces, just move them around, you know, rotate them and translate them, and you get double the volume. Has anyone not seen this before? Or has anyone seen? Okay, so not, not everyone has seen it. So then I'm kind of glad I get to be the first one to blow some people's mind, minds here. Um, yeah, this sounds, okay, first of all, this sounds like I'm probably leaving out something or I've said something wrong, right? This sounds false. Um, I mean, at least I would think it sounds false, right? Because I've doubled the volume by just taking congruent partitionings. Turns out it's not false, but okay, why, why would you think it's false? It's, I mean, there's a simple sort of calculation. Like it seems to imply one equals two, right? You have the, the volume of A is one, which should be the sum of the volumes of the pieces, but these are congruent to those sets, so that should be the sum of those pieces, which is the volume of B, which is two. So it kind of implies one equals two in a sense. So here's a question. So does anyone know why this calculation, why this doesn't imply one equals two? Why there isn't, this contradiction doesn't work? Yeah, that, that's, that's the right intuition, yeah. So, yeah, exactly. So the problem comes right, yeah, kind of right here. The thing is that these pieces, they might not have a well-defined volume. If you study measure theory, you, you'll know that there's such a thing as a non-measurable set. So if, I, if, if all the pieces are you know, non-measurable, then you can't write the volume of AI. That doesn't make any sense. There's no, there's no consistent way to kind of define a volume uh, for each piece. You don't have a volume of every subset of, the, of R3. So like I said, the pieces are non-measurable. That's kind of the, the sneaky thing here. 
um, which allows this to be possible. One kind of downside of the proof, though, is it's non-constructive. So you know that this partition exists, but they use the axiom of choice to find it. So there's no sort of procedure for determining how to cut up your sphere or your, your ball into, into these pieces. At some point, you just say it exists because of the axiom of choice, and, and so it exists. Right, so that's a very natural question. What about in two dimensions, right? If I take one disk, can I turn it into two disks? That, that would be kind of the natural analog, right? Oh, by the way, I should, pro before talking about two dimensions, I'll just mention bonak tarski holds in higher dimensions as well. Um, and, it's, and they actually prove something much more general than this. So, but, so yeah, for dimension four, five, six, et cetera, you can turn a ball into two balls. But yeah, I think, I mean, as a mathematician, I don't really, I know we live in three dimensions, but I don't love three dimensions because I can't draw it on a board very well. Um, so yeah, you would kind of, you know, it is kind of natural to ask what happens in two dimensions, right? Can you turn a, a disk into two disks? But this is not possible. Bonnock proved in 1923 that if I take a disk in R2, it's not equidecomposable to two disks of the same area, which is kind of a weird difference between two dimensions and three dimensions. Um, in fact, if I take any two measurable sets in R2, if they, so if they are measurable and if they're equidecomposable, they have to have the same measure. So you can't, you can't turn something of area one into something of area two. Now, I don't want to get into the weeds of like why this is the case, what's the real difference between two and three dimensions, but briefly, so okay, in two dimensions, you also have these non-measurable sets, but if you relax your condition of what a measure is, so a measure is usually countably additive. If I take a countable union of sets, the union, the union should have the measure summing up, or count, sorry, countable union of disjoint sets. The sum of the measures of those sets should add up to the measure of the whole thing. If you restrict that, if you just relax that to saying you want it to be finitely additive, you can actually give an area to every subset of the plane, invariant under all isometries. Okay, so two dimensions, things are different. You can't turn a ball and you can't turn a, a disk into two disks. A natural question then is to ask like, what can you do? What can, for example, what can you decom equity compose a disk into? And kind of a natural challenge is like, can you turn it into a square of the same, uh, provided they have the same area. If the area is different, you can't do it. But uh, so this was Tarski's problem uh, question in 1925. Uh, so he asked, is the disk in R2 equity composable to a square of the same area? I'll give you the answer to this in a, in a minute. Actually, it was in the abstract as well. So, but uh, yeah, so let's just, so a bit of terminology. Uh, equity decomposition from a disk to a square is called a circle squaring or a squaring of the circle. So before I like, before we talk about the actual answer to this question, let's look at a sort of simpler version of it where the answer is going to be no. So if you're like me, like when I first heard about this, the first thing I did was draw a circle, <laughs> start like drawing lines through it, maybe straight lines, like cut it up into four and, you know, these kinds of things and try to rearrange the pieces to make a square. And you just keep doing that and failing and failing and failing. Let me show you that any approach like that is going to fail, no matter how finely you cut up the circle. So basically, I want to say, if the way you want to make your pieces is by cutting the circle and also similarly cutting the square using line segments that are, I don't know exactly what conditions I need, but kind of continuous line segments with finite length, then it's no matter what, what you do, it's going to fail. So basically, I want to say, can you square the circle with a pair of scissors? So I want to prove it's impossible, and I want to do, do this by contradiction. So suppose you've done it, right? You've cut up using finitely many line segments or continuous kind of curves. I've cut up the square. I've cut up the circle. And let's say you can match up the pieces so that they're pairwise congruent. Now, obviously, this picture doesn't do it because I'm trying to prove it's impossible, but, uh, but yeah. So I want to prove that no matter how you've done this, it's not going to work. So what I want to do, so here's the, the proof. So imagine you have a piece of this, let's say a piece of the square that you've cut up. So what, what I want you to do is walk around that piece. Whenever you see a, so this is a, maybe a bit of a rough proof, but uh, whenever you basically see a, a sort of segment of, of the boundary where the curvature at that point is the same as the curvature of the 
the whole disk you're trying to turn it into, color that point red. So maybe, I don't know, maybe over here, these points have the right curvature. I don't know if curvature is even the right word, but, but basically if, the, if it's sort of round in the same way that the, the disk is round. Oh, and, and actually there's another thing I need. So I color it red if it has the same curvature as the disk and it's like concave at that point. Similarly, now, if I, if I have the same kind of curvature, but it's concave at that point, I color it, well, in this case, I've only got a pur purple chalk, but on the slide, it'll be blue. So if it's, if it's got the same curvature as the circle, but it's concave, I color it blue. So now what you'll notice in the square is that, like, because the boundary, the actual boundary doesn't have any red or blue, except for, like, isolated points, if I take the length of the red, to the total, add up the total length of the red, which is finite because my curves have finite length. And I take the total length of the blue, it, it adds up to the same thing because everything is sort of matched by some blue on the other side. Do the same thing to the circle. Now, if I look at just the interior stuff, everything cancels out, but you've got all this stuff on the outside, which is all gonna be red. So basically now the contradiction is these pieces can't be pairwise congruent because if they were, so, I mean, this, in this case, your red length equals blue length, but that case it doesn't, right? The red is much longer than the, the blue. So it can't work. Right, so the answer is no. This argument and probably a more rigorous or a more general version of it goes back to Dubin's Hirsch and Carouche from 1963. So you can't do it with scissors, but what I want to tell you now is that you can do it. So, so Laskovich proved in 1990 that the square is equidecomposable to the, or the disk, there's a, there's a circle squaring. Just a few kind of comments about this, his, his results. So the number of pieces, he kind of roughly estimates it, looking at the worst case, and it's maybe something like 10 to the 50. I mean, that's huge, but it's something like the number of atoms in the Earth or something like that, which is not like the number of atoms in the universe. So a really interesting feature of the proof he only uses, like when, when you look at the congruences between the pieces, he only uses translations. So every piece of the, the circle is congruent to a piece of the square where the congruence is just a translation, no rotations, um, and definitely no reflections. Now, a little bit of an unfortunate thing, he uses the axiom of choice. So the proof is non-constructive. There's no procedure for constructing his circle squaring. Um, and then also, it, like in the Bonaktarsky paradox, it gives us this issue that we can't really, we have no idea what these pieces are gonna look like. I mean, they could just be weird smatterings of points all over the place in some non-measurable, nasty way, but it exists. So it's an, it's an existence proof. So then a question that's kind of been kicking around since 1990 or so is, you know, can you do better than this? So is there a sort of a constructive circle squaring? For example, it doesn't use the axiom of choice or I mean, there's various different versions of this question that have been asked by different people, but basically, can you do this in a easier to, to kind of understand way? I don't think that there was very much progress on this for a long time. The first sort of big breakthrough in this direction came in 2017. So this is a result of Grabowski, Mate, and Prokurko, which says that you can square the circle in such a way that all the pieces are Lebesgue measurable. So if you don't like measure theory, you're not familiar with it, that just means basically each piece has a well-defined area, which obviously we weren't able to do with Bonaktarsky, right? You can't, because you can't turn volume one into volume two, but there's no actual restriction here because the circle and the square have the same area. So in some sense, this is, I mean, it's theoretically possible and they proved it's actually possible. This thing exists. So they still use the axiom of choice, which is a bit of a downside of this result, but they use it more sparingly. So meaning basically they use it on a set of measure zero. Kind of 100% of the points of the, square, the circle can be constructively matched to a point of the square, but there's still a 0%, non-empty 0% of points that have to be done with the axiom of choice. So this was then improved really quickly after um, by Marx and Unger, who proved that there's a circle squaring where the pieces are Borel, which if you're not into Measure theory, you might not know what this means, but basically this is even nicer than Lebesgue measurable sets. So these things have a, a well-defined area as well, but, uh, but it's even nicer. And the really nice thing is that their proof is fully constructive. So no axiom of choice or anything like that. So in some sense, they, there's like 
kind of an algorithm for constructing their circle squaring. Although maybe algorithm is used loosely, you have to allow things like infinite loops and nested infinite loops and things like that. But if you kind of allow that sort of thing, then it's an algorithm. Okay, so what did we do? Vaguely speaking, we got a construction which is simpler in a sense than the Marx and Unger construction. It's a little bit difficult to say how it's simpler, but basically if you think of their, their thing as being constructible by, via a certain kind of an algorithm, if you think of their algorithm, it's sort of, you've got infinite loops, which, which have infinite loops in them, and infinite loops in those infinite loops, sort of nested at depth three, and then some finite operations on the outside of all these infinite loops to piece things together. Whereas you can kind of describe our whole circle squaring with one infinite loop and then some finite operations. But in some sense that causes the pieces that we get to, to be lower in the Borel hierarchy than their pieces. The real kind of cool thing I think about the result is because our sort of algorithm is simpler, it allows us to kind of access some structure of the pieces. And we can in particular prove that these pieces are visualizable in a certain sense, which I will explain on the next slide. So maybe I'll, I'll state the, the actual theorem, which I think I had some typos in and which I didn't fix. But okay, so really this is what the theorem says. So there's a squaring of the circle by translations. So the, all the, just like in Laskovich, all the things are translations, such that each piece is a Boolean combination of F sigma sets. An F sigma set is sort of, if you know about open and closed sets in topology, it's sort of one level above open and closed sets in terms of complexity. And the boundary of each piece has upper Minkowski dimension at most 1.98, which is something about the visualizable part of it. Okay, so let's talk about this, what I mean by visualizable. So essentially when I say that our circle squaring is visualizable, what I mean is that if you have a really, 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 really good TV with a really high definition, you can sort of see the picture with only small errors um, that kind of go to zero as the definition of your TV goes to infinity. So what do I really mean by that? So imagine you take the square of area one and imagine I've drawn the pieces of the equity composition on the square. And now I want to approximate that picture. So I, you know, this picture might be kind of complicated looking, but I want to approximate it on a grid, which is what your TV does, right? I mean, you take a continuous image and you approximate it with pixels. So take a grid, let's say an n by n grid, and the rule for how to display this on a TV, you know, on this n by n TV, is going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be kind of a restrictive rule. If, a, if I look at a square, if every single point in that square has the same color, meaning it belongs to the same piece, then I color that square with the color corresponding to that piece. So suppose I've got 10 to the 200 colors or something corresponding to the, the different pieces, then if everything in that square has the same, is in the same piece, I color it with that color. Maybe all of these ones are, are red, all of those ones are red, maybe at some point we get purple, and, uh, and so on. However, if you take a, obviously some of these squares are gonna contain more than one color, points from more than one piece, and on those squares that contain more than one piece, I just color it gray. So I don't really have a gray chalk, but let's put a G for gray. So yeah, if there's a little bit of purple in here and a little bit of red, a little bit of brown, let's say, we just color it gray and we just say, like I can't determine the color of that pixel because it's got two colors on it. So what we can prove is that, so for large N, so this is the sense in which this is visualizable, the number of gray squares is at most N to the 1.98, if you do this kind of algorithm of coloring the squares. Of course, the total number of squares is n squared, right? So it means that a small proportion, if you kind of, if you kind of divide by n squared, right, a sort of you know, diminishing proportion of the squares are gray. So if you take a very high, you know, a very large grid, you can get a pretty good picture. There's still going to be some gray squares in there, but, uh, but not that many. What this really says is this, this complicated statement from the previous slide that the boundary of the pieces have up, upper Minkowski dimension at most 1.98. That just means if you do this kind of approximate picture, the number of gray squares is gonna have an exponent, like it's gonna be n to the 1.98. That's the, this dimension thing. So let me tell you a little bit about the proof, although actually, I mean, in the beginning, saying that this talk is based on our new paper is 
a little bit misleading because I'm not going to, the new ideas in our paper are really kind of in some very technical details, which I'm not going to get into for this. Um, but what I really want to do is just give you a little bit of an intuition of some of the ideas. And specifically, I want to highlight where we use ideas from a basic undergrad course in, in graph theory in this proof. We'll see if I can, how much of that I can convince you of. So let A be a disk, B be a square, same area. I want to equidecompose A into B. This seems like a irrelevant thing. It turns out to be quite useful conceptually. I'm going to think of A and B as both living in the unit square. And let's say they're disjoint sets in the, in the unit square. OK, fair enough. I guess I can do that. I mean, if they were bigger, I'd just scale them by the same factor and put them in the square. When I'm dealing with anything in the unit square, if I add two vectors, so I'm going to view this square as being like a torus, right? If I add two vectors and they go outside the square, I kind of reduce it modulo 1. So if I take the vector 0 0.75, 0 0.6, and 0 0.5, 0 0.4, I add those together. I mean, normally you would get 1.25 and 1, but I reduce it mod 1. So I subtract the 1 from both of them, and I get 0 0.25, 0. Okay, this all seems kind of irrelevant, but it's kind of a, a useful part of the strategy. So in particular, if I take, so this vector addition is done modulo, modulo 1, but also if I take a set and I translate it by a vector, I, I view those translations modulo 1. So if I send this over here, it's really, you know, or let's say I send it over here, it, it ends up possibly there. So here's uh, the first step. Essentially what I want to do, by the way, in, in the whole strategy, I want to have a set of translation vectors because I'm going to do this equity decomposition using translations. And I want to associate each point of the, the disk with a translation vector which lands it somewhere in the square such that for each translation vector that I use, I want the set of points that use that thing to be disjoint over here and, yeah, and cover the whole square. OK, so the whole thing comes down to kind of picking your, the right translation vectors and, and things like that. OK, so let x1, x2 be two random vectors in the square. In order to kind of conceptualize all of this, it's useful to build a graph now. So here's where the graph theory is starting to come in. It's going to be a very simple graph, though. So, so basically, the graph has vertex set, which is every, you know, every point in this, in this unit square. uv is an edge if. So OK, I've written this in a slightly different way here. But so there's sort of a few conditions. u and v could be plus minus x1. So if I start drawing my graph, the neighbors of a vertex v, you've got v plus x1. You've got v minus x1. You could have this being plus minus x2. So you've got it's starting to look like a grid. Actually, if I suppose I just, at this point, I just, I just draw these types of edges. It is going to be a grid, right? Because this is going to be, you know, v plus x1 plus x2. Now, for certain kind of advent, you know, there's certain advantages to not making this quite a grid. So we're going to add also the basically it's a grid with the diagonal edges added. So I also add edges across like this. But from a graph theory point of view, this is a pretty boring graph. But yeah, so is it clear the kind of definition? It can, just, it can just mean uniformly at random, but it can, yeah, so the, the randomness comes in with in certain discrepancy estimates that have to be satisfied. It, it actually, technically, they don't really have to be random. It just, if they are random, then these, these bounds will be satisfied with probability one. But, but yeah, it's really needed for some kind of discrepancy that if I take translations of uh, integer multiples of these vectors, they should kind of have the right number in, in every kind of square. OK, so uh, I mean, this is the picture I've drawn, basically. So, so yeah, this is, so if I take a vertex, the component uh, you know, that that vertex is in is just going to be a big grid. Of course, the grid, the grid is countable, right? But my graph is uncountable. So I've got uncountably many components, all of which just look like a grid. Although if, so that this, they, they do look, look like a grid given that x, x1, x2, you know, don't satisfy any rational equations because otherwise I could 
you know, walk over here, and then that's the same as that vertex or something, and things wrap up. But if they're random, that won't happen. OK, so here's the goal. I want to match every vertex of A, which is the disk, to a vertex of B, which is at bounded distance in this graph, where bounded is an absolute bound, like 10 to the 100. Now, why would that be good enough? And when I say match, I mean each vertex of A is matched to exactly one vertex of B, and each vertex of B is matched to exactly one vertex of A. So it's a perfect matching. It's not a perfect matching in the graph, but it, in like the 10 to the 100th power of the graph or something, it's a perfect matching. So the translation vectors end up being like n1 times x1 plus n2 x2, where n1 and n2 are between, let's say, 10 to the 100 and negative 10 to the 100. So there's only finitely many choices of n1 and n2. And so there's ends up being finitely many pieces. OK, so that's the kind of, the kind of goal. And I think the graph is helpful for sort of coming up with this goal. I don't know, depending on how familiar, familiar you are with things like flows and matchings and different things in combinatorial optimization, you might know that there, there's a connection between matchings and flows. In some sense, a flow is sort of a fractional sort of version of a, I mean, not, not exactly a version of a matching, but it's a related concept anyway. And this is an idea that goes, that's from the paper of Marx and Unger, really nice idea, which is instead of shooting for a matching right at the start, let's be a little bit slower about it. First, let's build a flow in the graph and then slowly convert that flow into a matching. So by the way, I'm not sure if people know what a flow is, but you should think of current flowing through a, through a circuit or something. So on every edge, there's sort of some sort of flow going from that vertex to that vertex. And the flow going the other way is the negative of that flow. The first step in, in the proof is to find a flow in the graph, which has the following kind of properties. The flow out of each vertex of A is 1. So if I compute for every edge leaving A, I add up all the flow values, it should be plus 1. For every vertex of B, the flow is negative 1. The flow out of each vertex that's not in A or B is 0. In some sense, you should think of the A, everything in A is sort of a, a sort of source, kind of. It has plus 1 flow out of it. So if I add up, basically, if I take the sum over all U, F V U, if if B is in A, it should be 1. And for something in B, it should be negative 1. Anything else should be 0. In some sense, this is a, a weaker version of the matching thing, kind of. Because if I, took, if I had a matching, you could kind of take each vertex of A and look at where it's matched in B and take a path that goes from A to B and put a flow value of 1 on that path. Oh, and also we want this flow to be uniformly bounded. So the, the total flow on any edge has to be bounded by some explicit constant as well, which I didn't write here. So this flow thing, by the way, it can use, it doesn't have to use integer values on the edges or anything, right? So flows are sort of, they use flat fractional values. Whereas a matching is nice. A matching is very integer. Something which is sort of a little bit closer to a matching is an integer valued flow. Essentially, the second idea is to bound your, your flow to an integer valued flow. The third step is to convert that integer valued flow into a matching. So let me sort of just say a couple of things. So I'm sort of going to skip this. Basically, the existence of the flow is actually kind of the easy, easy part of this. It, well, although it, it uses a kind of uh, nice lemma of Laskovich. But, uh, but yeah, basically, it, turn, it boils down to max flow min cut. You, you either have a flow that works, or you have a small bottleneck. Let me just briefly say something about how to turn a flow into an integer valued flow, just because this involves Euler's theorem, which from graph theory. One way to change a flow without changing the flow out of any vertex is to take a cycle and just increase the flow value or decrease the flow value along that cycle. So that's kind of the idea that we use. So, so basically, I, I, have this, I have a fractional flow on this, this graph, and I want to change it to an integer flow. First step is cover or almost sort of cover the thing with a bunch of orange blobs like this. And I want to basically, in the orange blobs, I want to shift these to integer values. So what you can do is go around the boundary and shift the flow value on triangles. So if I shift it on this triangle, I can get that purple 
edge to be integer valued. Just shift it to the ceiling of what it was. And then I can shift this one and that one and kind of fix all the edges as, as I go. Of course, you need to do this in a consistent way, well, in a way that's going to eventually shift everything to an integer value. Turns out the reason you can do that is Euler's theorem. So quickly, if I take the edges of the boundary of this set, I make a graph where the vertices correspond to those edges. Two edges are adjacent, or two vertices are adjacent if they are in a, share a common triangle. That graph is just Eulerian. It's connected, it has even degrees. So you can kind of wiggle around the whole graph nicely um, and end up where you started. And that'll basically shift every edge to an integer value at the end. And then you can apply standard things from graph theory like the integer flow theorem to get the flows inside to be integer valued as well. That only fixes the edges inside these orange blobs, but then you can take bigger blobs and then you can do this kind of going, so which kind of uh, play well with the orange blobs and you kind of take a limit as this goes to infinity, it covers everything. Um, anyway, so yeah, maybe I'll just stop there and uh, thanks for your attention. It's exactly from that, yeah. Yeah, it's basically, well, okay, there's, there is one other part of the proof that also sort of has that sort of thing, and you combine these together, these two infinite loops. But, uh, but yeah, basically it is from that, that you cover it slowly, and you take that going to infinity.